team this morning, I have this crazy anticipation that God is going to do something like crazy. Anybody else with me believe that God might do something crazy today? Well, you know how sometimes in your spirit you get a battle plan, right? And the, the Lord gave us a battle plan this morning. And I feel it's for the whole church that the first couple of songs, you might feel distractions around you, right? You might not know the words. You might not know what to do. But there's an anointing coming as we rest in his presence where there's going to be healing. There's going to be chains fall on the ground and freedom in this place. Simply in the quiet of his presence. But sometimes, sometimes, amen, in America, sometimes there's a warfare that's needed to press into that quiet place, right? So I'm going to challenge you this morning, yeah.
song this morning? If you're new to this church, I just tell you, we're not crazy. We simply have had something happen to us that is so real. That is so real, that is so life-altering, so life-changing. That I will never again fight a battle on my own without the power of the Holy Spirit, amen? Amen. Never again. Cause I'm a river, a river, a river in a desert land. I'm a river, oh, a river. I'm a river in a desert land. I'm a river, I'm a river, oh, a river in a desert land. I'm a river, yeah, a river, yeah, oh, a river in a desert land. so good church
think it's so cool that this, this song today, Will didn't know in choosing it that it was prophetic because when he's saying prepare the way, guys, I'm telling you, so today's sermon series begins a sermon series about using your voice to tell your story. And I'm telling you, there is power in your voice. And what the enemy wants you to do is just be quiet. No, keep your thoughts to yourself about God. Keep your thoughts to yourself. Shh, don't ruffle any, fad any feathers, right? How many have ever had that stupid voice in your head that says, don't say anything, don't say anything, keep the peace, come on. But this song is about preparing the way of the Lord and letting the God of Isaac and Jacob rise up in your spirit and declare his goodness. Come on, amen. So we're going to sing this again. And this time I want you to realize this is not something the worship team is just singing and we're kind of taking part in. No, let it stir in your spirit that you can prepare the way of the Lord for other people. You can prepare the way. You can lower the mountain and you can raise the valley so that they can enter the goodness of God. Amen. Come on, sing it.
to do and I don't know what to sing I let my words be few and I'll sing worthy is your name worthy 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 that you are worthy 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 that you are worthy 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 that you are worthy of our praise I feel this over feeling in my spirit that there's battles at stake, that there's lives at stake this morning. And there's an uncomfortableness with what's happening right now. And, and, and I want to tell you that I know that feeling. What do I do when I know my life's at stake, when I know I haven't been in the way I'm supposed to walk. This is, might be just for one person this morning. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm just asking the church that are intercessors and believers to be praying and interceding and worshiping right now. If you don't know what to do, just sing holy, holy. Prayer, war prayer warriors, pray right now. I feel like there's a life at stake. Maybe you grew up in church and fell away, and maybe you're embarrassed. But God Almighty, the King of Kings, the Good Father, is running after you this morning. And it takes the most courageous act you could ever do. No matter if you were in a war or you've run into fires to save people, this morning the most courageous act you could do is to surrender. We surrender unto you. We surrender unto you. So God, uh, you're good. You're perfect. God is so good. So good. And 
for all of us, but especially if it's that's you this morning. This is your song, okay? Because this says our one defense is our righteousness before the King. You can't fight battles on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. manufacture anything obviously but knowing what God is speaking this morning that we fought through uh, some barriers and now we're in his presence the silly thing to do would be to to move past that place right away right to just rush on past because there's power in the sweet anointing of sitting at his feet so as we do this quiet song saying that nothing else matters except being in the presence of Jesus. You're welcome to sit down. You're welcome to come to the altar if you need to spend time with Jesus. You're welcome to stand and sing. You're welcome to lay down. You are welcome to just sit at the feet of Jesus, okay?
This is totally in line with what Pastor Jordan's preaching. I am the most proud father. Because I want to tell you something this morning. Your voice, her voice, 
matters and it has power. And my daughter, who has sometimes fear and anxiety come up, even, even talking to people she doesn't know, or she's shy, right? But when we pray and when we worship, she is unashamed before the king. When we spent a week here praying and worshiping, my daughter was by herself, worshiping in the quiet. Whatever you are going through, whatever the enemy says that you can't do, could we just close our eyes for a minute, lift your voice to the king. to move your lips. You don't have to have to sing it. Just tell him that he's holy. The king is holy. Jesus is the king. Yeshua the king. Yeshua the king. Holy, holy. Go ahead, just lift up his name. He's holy, holy, holy word. Oh, just worship the Lamb of God. Come on. Just worship the Lamb of God. He's the son of David, the rose of Sharon. And he's more beautiful than anything we could ever see. More than anything, Jesus. You see, a song like this is important. A guy named Cody Carnes wrote this song. And every now and then, God will use a songwriter like a Matt Redman if you remember Heart of Worship and those other songs that is given to a nation. And I believe this song, I really believe this song is given to a nation. I really believe that. Because I'm gonna ask Cadence to sing that verse two again. Because here's what happens. In American Christianity, we come to believe, I come here, I come just for a blessing. God, you're, you're here for me. And while God loves you, I have news for you. You're actually here for him. You're here for him. You're, you're, you have yours of enjoyment. But here's the thing. You're on the earth to glorify him. Amen. And so when we repent like that and we say, God, I'm not here for a blessing. Forgive me for thinking that you're a genie in a box. Forgive me for thinking that I'm just going to come to you when I need you. No. He's the God of all creation. He is the God of all wonders. Amen. So I'm going to have her sing this again, and I'm actually going to ask something. We've only done this a few times here. I'm going to ask you to sit down for a minute and just close your eyes and let this be an anthem of Rock of Grace right now. Can you sing that again? I'm not here for a blessing, and then go into that chorus. And let these lyrics, let this truth sink into your soul, because like we, one of the quotes I say here often, right, is when he... Um, Tozer, A.W. Tozer, said the soul's paradox of love is to have found Jesus and to continue searching for him. And I want to tell you, only Jesus can satisfy you. Only Jesus. Say that with me. Only Jesus. And again, not the blessings he gives, but the person of Jesus. I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough, won't take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. See, I'm sorry again. And I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough will take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. In your presence, I just wanna see. i 
Just want you and nothing else. Just want you. Nothing else. Come on, tell that to Jesus right now. Nothing else. More than that promotion at work. Even more than a physical healing, God. I just want you. I want to know you, Jesus. Oh, nothing else, God. Nothing else will do. Just want you, God. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you, God. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. God, all we want is to know you. So God, thank you for bending our hearts and bending our knees this morning. And God, we do say as a church, forgive us for any time that, that we've come to church or even opened our Bible just to get something from you instead of getting to know you. Remind us today of why the veil was torn when your blood hit the ground on Calvary. It was so that we could have friendship with you, intimacy with you, that we could see your holiness and be near you and love you and hear how you love us and be in communion together. So God, we love you. If you love them, say, well, I love you, Jesus. Come on, one more time, say, I love you, Jesus. Amen, it's, it's always hard to transition out of worship, especially at a time like this. I wanna invite you right now to find someone in the room that's not sitting in your section and look him in the eyes and say, Jesus really does love you. Right now, go find somebody, look him right in the eye. Jesus really does love you. Hello, good morning. How are you guys? It's so good to see all of you. I hope you guys had a good weekend. Nice long weekend last week, but it's great to see some of your faces back here with us. Uh, if you are a guest, welcome. We're really glad that you're here with us today. Um, there's a couple of things. We would love the opportunity just to be able to connect with you. There's a couple simple ways to do that. One, there's a 
uh, in the seat back in front of you, there's a card that looks like this. It says, let's connect. If you just want to take a, uh, a moment and fill that out, you can drop it in one of the boxes as you leave here this morning. Or if you're really brave, you can take it up to the counter in the foyer and uh, hand this to someone there, and they will give you a gift. And that's another just great way for us to be able to put a face to your name and get you connected. Um, I'm just going to uh, highlight a couple of things for you. Um, oh, I did forget. Also, another way you can connect is if you have a smartphone, you can text NEW at Rock of Grace, and the number is right there up on the screen, 94000. That's another really just simple way. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple um, of events that are up and coming. The first is water baptism, which we have a little video for you to watch. My name is Pastor Jordan Beal, and I'm the lead pastor of Rock of Grace. And I want to tell you today about water baptism, and I want to invite you to take part. What is water baptism? Kind of strange, right? Going uh, into the water. Well, it's actually a commandment of Jesus. And so for me, I think this is a sign of our discipleship. One of the things we say here often is that believers agree, but disciples obey. And in Matthew 28, we're actually commanded to go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have said, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, 3 through 4 says that when we are uh, buried in the water, it's like we're buried with Jesus. And when we come out of the water, it's like we are resurrected with Jesus. So we're resurrected into new life. And who knows what's gonna happen uh, when you come out of that water and make that declaration as a Jesus follower. Maybe like Jesus, you will step into a season of miracles and preaching with boldness, the kingdom of God and the hope of Jesus Christ to your coworkers, your neighbors, to your circle of influence. So I wanna invite you out to be water baptized. All right, so awesome. So today, right after church, right across this hall, there's, it's called the yellow room because it's got yellow paint and stuff in there. Um, that is where the meeting's going to be held. If you signed up, you can go right there. If you haven't signed up, it's okay. Uh, maybe you just felt a little prompting in your heart that that's what you want to do. Walk over after service and jump in there, okay? Um, you don't have to uh, be signed up to join that today. Um, all right, so another kind of cool thing is out in the foyer today, there is a book. It's called Process of a Leader, and it was actually written by our pastor, Pastor Jordan Beal. And uh, if it's a dream in your heart, maybe uh, you want to be a business owner or you're just a, a, a leader, or maybe there's something in ministry. Uh, what are your next steps? What should I do? Uh, this would be a good book to grab, and it'll be right out there in the foyer. Um, save the date. I know this is kind of far in advance, but it's good to put the bug in your ear now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, January 14th is a financial seminar. Um, this isn't just for adults. I would actually encourage if you are a young person, you know, they don't teach just regular checkbook math anymore <laughs> in school. And this is a great place to get your foundation. Go find out how to um, budget how to plan, and how to see how the Lord can bless your finances. Start on the right foot, even when you're young. And maybe you're an adult and you've messed it up for a really long time. Maybe your parents never taught you. Maybe you just didn't know that God has a plan for your finances. He does. And you can start at any age. So mark your calendar and uh, just pray about it because God can use, uh, God can use your finances not only just to bless and set your own life on path, but others. All right. Uh, the next thing is the fall conference. This is coming up in October. I mean, it's coming up quick. The 9th through the 11th, this is going to be three powerful nights, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, we do this once a year. It's a great time of worship in the word and prayer. And we're just really um, praying that God will move uh, not only here, but really in our community and in our country. So please uh, mark your calendars for that. You, this is something you don't want to miss. And tonight, 
it's already time for Immerse. So if you are available, yes. Uh, if you want to join uh, many different uh, communities and churches, tonight is going to be at Horizons at 630. And it's just always a really powerful time. Thank you, Jesse. Give Jesse a hand. I wanted... I wanted to introduce our missionary today. Um, I know we had one last week. We usually have about uh, once every four to six weeks, but the schedules just worked out perfectly where they were both in town and these dates were available. And I definitely couldn't pass up Lauren being in town and having her here because I actually got the privilege of getting to know Lauren six years ago. And she came over to Innovate Records when I was a producer before I was a pastor and got to, uh, well, it was a youth pastor, but not the lead pastor, and got to uh, create two albums, a kid's album, and uh, a worship album, like soaking. And you guys love like soaking music. It's like pianos and cellos and a vocal. Pick up, Lauren. hey, shameless plug, pick up Lauren's album. It's so good. I want to invite you to come up, put your hands together for Lauren Wiberg and Wonder Kids. Oh, thank you, Pastor Jordan. This is such an honor to be with you this morning. And I am the director of Wonder Kids here. And actually, before I was doing this ministry, I was working with another mission organization called SOS Adventure. I was able to lead 80,000 kids with a beautiful team to Jesus when I was with that ministry. And before that, I spent six years as a children's pastor at Victory Christian Center. So I love kids. They are my favorite in all the world. And I believe that they are huge on Jesus' heart. And so this year, actually, uh, in January, we just launched Wonder Kids. And you can see my beautiful family on the screen. Uh, I married a handsome Swede, and we are living in Sweden actually right now. That's Mikael and Elon. He's two. My parents are pastors in PA, and they are parading him around right now. Very proud grandparents. <laughs> so... But we love to do mission work together as a family. And so I just wanted to share with you this morning about what we've been up to. Because we love to do huge and small kids festivals where we're reaching as many kids as we can. Because you know, when you reach children, you are really reaching the next generation. And we want to teach children about how Jesus is fun, first of all. We want, when Jesus is fun, then you really can draw and open up a kid's heart when they're playing games and doing awesome music, but then the ultimate part of our ministry is we want children to encounter the Holy Spirit, because one touch with the Holy Spirit can change their life forever. So our vision is that we want them to know Jesus, choose him, and to live for him. So you can go to this next slide here. Uh, we are working with kids, but we're also training up leaders and we're working with parents because that's the key to continuing discipleship with children so they continue to, to live for Jesus. And we are specifically right now, um, we are going to Africa and India, many different places where we're getting to do these big festivals where you're going to see a video in a minute that will make more sense. But uh, when it comes to kids, we want to see kids that are partnering with the God of wonders. At our festivals and at our ministry, we see miracles. We see God deliver people and children from demons. And a lot of the cultures we go to, that is very strong. And then when they see the God of wonders activated, I mean, what kid wouldn't say that is better than Disney World when they see Jesus do miracles? And so that's what we believe God is doing and he has been doing through our festival ministry. On the next slide, we do training with the local leaders where we go. We just trained 212 when we were in Tanzania. We're teaching them how to have fun in their kids' ministries. But then once again, like I said, how do you lead your kids into an encounter with the Holy Spirit? So that even if there was a day that they turned away from Jesus, they'll say, that day marked me. For me, I was 12 years old when that happened. And it's marked me for the rest of my life. And that's what we want to see for the kids that we are ministering to. As well as parents, we invite them to our festivals. We want them to see what we're up to. And so that they can begin to see this even in their very homes. See the God of wonders through the daily life of, of them as a family. Next slide. You know, what we do in Wonder Kids is we do kids festivals. We have equip kids missionaries. We have fun day, aid, and discipleship. So the next slide, you're going to see this a little deeper. Uh, our kids festival, this was in June, was our very first one on our own with Wonder Kids. We were in Moshi, Tanzania. We reached 42,000 plus kids. It was really beautiful. We... 
We do, uh, we go into 32 schools when we were there. We have a specialized uh, sermon and drama. Our music, I love music, as you, you know. So we write all our original music and we get it translated in the local language. Um, so everything we're doing, we're going to schools, preaching, but then we had a four day festival. So that's why you're seeing all these kids there. Uh, next slide. You will see that we love to equip kid missionaries. That means that maybe you would join us next year and maybe in Africa. That would be fun, huh? So we would give you all the tools that you would be able to come and be equipped to know how to, to do the mission work we're doing. And we also partner with local people that are learning the sermon and the drama and the dances we do where we can go and reach thousands of kids is our prayer. Next slide, I love our fun day. And it's a very simple explanation to say what the day is about. It's fun. We rent bounce houses. We paint the kids' faces. We feed them. We show them that this is the best day of your life because then it finishes with a Holy Spirit party. And it's an amazing day. Uh, the next thing we do is we are doing certain ter um, types of aid, and I'm, we're beginning to think of different ways we can do our aid. Right now, we're feeding kids on our fun day. We fed, uh, there was 8,000 kids at our fun day, so we are working on how, <laughs> you know, we're feeding these kids, and you would not believe how some of them are just so excited about even a simple meal of rice and beans and a piece of meat or something like this. So they are so excited. Uh, the next slide is discipleship. I, I would say I'm half evangelist, half discipler. I have this huge passion to see it continue forward. So we are doing that through working with local uh, local Sunday school teachers and pastors to continue the work, as well as they each get a, a book that I have wrote, and it's really, it goes with our message. And actually, just yesterday, uh, we had our third outreach in Moshi, where we were in June, where they are still continuing to gather children around the city, doing our music and preaching about the Holy Spirit and our own fire from our training, which was so encouraging to see the, the fire continue and more kids come to know Jesus. Uh, you can go to the next slide here. Ultimately, we want to see ch children encounter Jesus. This is a huge piece of my heart. I've seen what God does inside of kids, and it's so powerful when they really can meet with Jesus. We just, you know, there's no junior Holy Spirit. I'm sure you've heard that before. If you haven't, though, let that just set in for a moment. Jesus didn't just come and say, I'm a Holy Spirit for adults. He wants to do it for kids. And this is so powerful when they meet with him. I want to tell you about a little girl quickly whose name was Fatuma. You can go to the next slide. One night when I was preaching at our festival, I saw her out in the crowd and she was lifting her hands. And I thought, I need to wrap my arms around this girl. So I went out in the crowd and wrapped my arms around her like you see there. And all of a sudden, as soon as I left her, she started manifesting. We took her back into our tent where then she was set free that night. And she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was so so powerful because then it was, I believe it was 10 more kids or yeah, 10 kids that night that got set free by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I followed up and went to her school the next week because I was so curious what her story was. And I found out that she has two witch doctor uh, grandmothers that are doing rituals outside of her window. And would you know that I'm able just to sit with Fatuma and tell her, but you don't have to be afraid anymore. Those dreams that you're having, you can just say, Jesus, come now. And you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit and he will come into your bedroom and you will feel the peace of God. This is what we want to see for these kids, that they can walk and have the tools to walk through a, a life of, of victory in Jesus. And we're going to see this more and more. And we saw it at our festival this summer. The next slide here. Uh, is where we're going next. Uh, next month, my family and I, we are going to be going to India and Nepal. And this is really exciting for me because I love getting into the unreached areas where we can reach kids that have never heard the gospel. So we will we'll be there. And then in June, we will actually be back in Tanzania, but we will be in the outskirts of Arusha where we're going to get in Maasai land, where we're going to be reaching really people that have never, kids that have never heard the gospel. So we're so excited about this. Next slide.
You can join us by coming on a mission with us. We would love to have so many of you join us and learn these dances and hug these kids to Jesus. You can partner with us financially. These festivals obviously cost some money, but it's so worth every dollar. And you can pray with us. Wow, we need prayer warriors to cast out those demons behind the scenes. Come on. And then we need to share the good news of Wonder Kids. The next slide. Uh, you will see that you can follow all that we do. It's, it's a lot of exciting things that are happening, and you will see all of our pictures. Uh, next slide, you can see all of this at wonderkidsman.com. And I will actually be in the lobby, and I would love to answer any questions. I want to get to know you more. I think it's so important, the local church, to really partner together. I want to be your friend. I don't know if we can do that so fast, but maybe today we can have quick friendship because I would love to partner together so we can reach thousands upon thousands of kids around the world for Jesus. And there's nothing like a video and some pictures to just show what we're doing to paint the picture of our story. So thank you for today, and I hope you enjoy this video. Pretty awesome stuff, huh? So now you know why I was ecstatic when she said, hey, I'm in the area. Can I come out? Because I don't know, was anybody else feeling like you feeling the Holy Spirit while she was talking? I was ready to give my life to Jesus all over again, like right now. By the way, does anybody else head spin when it comes to 40,000 kids and the discipleship and all this stuff? Wow. There's such a gifting and a favor on your life, and we just are excited to partner with you. Uh, we want to just receive our offering right now, and of course, whenever we have a missionary, just still make your check to Rock of Grace and write missions on the envelope, missions, okay? Because it's really important that we as a local church realize that God is not just moving in Trumbull County, but all over the world, amen? And there's something really beautiful about us partnering with missionaries like Lauren and Wonder Kids, and so I'll say what I say every time, which is every family should have a personal missionary, uh, we have a couple uh, in our family, every missionary, or I'm sorry, every family, I believe, uh, in the States should have at least one couple, at least one missionary that they say, you know, we're going to give $10 or $50 every single month, whatever the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. So I want you to pray about that, because I personally, I'm believing for 10 this morning. When we prayed, I was like, Lord, I just see 10 of you. So I don't know who those 10 are, but if God's speaking to you, say yes, and it will be beautiful to get her reports of your dollars going to work. Well, Father, we love you. We thank you for speaking to our hearts. We thank you for an incredible time of being in your presence and just sitting at your feet in worship. God, make us more like Mary 
God, and any time that we've been like Martha and we've got too busy with our agenda, Lord, help us to be more like Mary and to sit at your feet. God, I pray that today as, we, as I share a bit of my story, as we talk about Jacob, as we hear from Lauren, Father, that you would open our hearts. God, make us all a little more transparent and honest and broken so that your grace can do its work. In Jesus' name. And everyone would said, amen. Amen. Well, hey, as they're receiving the offering, I want to do something fun real quick. Every six weeks, I pick one serve team volunteer to highlight. And today, I get to highlight my sister. So I need Emily and Trevor to come up here real quick. I'm going to embarrass you. I know you don't want to, but too bad. Come on down. The price is right, or the gift is right, maybe. Elena, help me out. Elena's our Vanna White today. Usually, it's like just this gift card, right, to a restaurant. But I had gone to Israel, and I had my friend Bishop uh, Stearns give me this giant gift bag of like chocolates and dates and oil from Israel and the Holy Spirit was like give it to Emily so there you go I almost took the olive oil out because I wanted it but no hey I want you to know real quick don't leave yet I want you to understand guys serve teams like this are incredibly important and so with they, these guys serve um, in many different ways they host a life group how many of you guys have little ones and you check in your kids and Emily and Ashley are helping you check in your kids yeah it's a beautiful thing. And so one more time, put your hands together for Trevor and Emily. Love you guys. I want to invite up Lauren as this what video plays. What if your plays. story is never heard? What if the testimonies of God's goodness, miracles, and salvation remain unshared and untold? Your children, your neighbors, and your family wouldn't know about the good things God has done. Your story matters. Your story is our story. It's God's story of redemption, grace, mercy, and kindness. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, God through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Your story of God's grace matters. Your story matters. So every single year, uh, I do a sermon series called My Story, kind of stealing my dad's idea. He did something called uh, Living Banners. How many guys have been here long enough to remember Living Banners? Yeah, that's right. And so the last three years, um, we did that via video, and we're still going to do a couple of those. But I want to do some just kind of live. We're going to do some interview style. And I actually asked Lauren last night, so she's, it's really cool that she's uh, spur of the moment. I said, hey, can I ask you just a couple questions at the beginning of my sermon because that helps us get to know and, and we can always glean something from someone's story. That's why that video ends like that. My story matters, your story matters. So turn to the person next to you or behind you, look at them awkwardly and say, your story matters. Get all nice and charismatic on them. <laughs> all right, your story matters. So one more time, put your hands to, actually just say, hi, Lauren. Yes, so Nolan says hi. All right, tell us. <laughs> I'm just going to ask a couple questions, all right, and be as candid, as real as possible. Okay, tell us when you first felt the call of God to ministry. I think you actually said maybe 12. Were you that young? Well, that actually was when I had this encounter with Jesus. Okay. But when I felt called to ministry, actually I was 19 years old, and I was going to Geneva College. I just graduated high school, and I was going to Geneva College one semester. And I was a mess. I cannot, I am telling you, almost every night I would leave my dorm room and go to the stairwell where I thought nobody knew I was there, and I was crying a lot. And it was so strange. And I could not put my finger on, what is wrong? Why am I crying so much? And finally, my RA came to me, and I was going to be an elementary school teacher. I wanted to work with kindergarten was why I was there. And my RA came to me one day and says, Lord, what is going on? And I said, I just feel like I know, I know reading and writing is so important, but I want to teach children about the power of God. I want to teach them about signs, wonders, and miracles, and I have to get to them. I have to leave here and go to Bible school is what I really felt. But then the Lord really stirred my heart for that, and it was one step after another where God was leading me in the direction of kids' ministry. So that's how it started. You could have literally wrote my sermon. In, in my message, <laughs> yes, later, I'm talking about take the next step. What's, to, what's the next step? And uh, in fact, let me ask that. It's not in my list of questions. But what was one of the next just first step? How many of you ever, you wonder what God has for your story, 
right? And you're picturing it maybe a foggy picture in your mind, but then often God has just one step of obedience he wants you to, to worry about. Just do that. So what was, what was like the next one step that, that God gave you an opportunity to walk through and you said yes and you just went through it? In that specific mm. situation, yeah. I actually, it was in the middle of the school year. So actually at Victory Christian Center with Bishop Thomas at that time, he was had his school there. And I thought that could be my next step, but they already started the school. But my step was write the email and just see, will you let me come in and just start here and just see what happens. But it was a step of faith because to me, I was looking up a ton of mission organizations and I wanted the full picture of what does this look like? And I'm a planner, so it was a big stress mess, but it was really just take that next step. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right, what was one of the hardest things you had to overcome to actually get on the mission field? Yes, I think it was getting over that I'm not that, like, yeah, how should I put this? When I was working at the church, before I went into the mission field, I was working there for six years, and I thought that I, I didn't know this at the time, but I thought that I was pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't know this, but I was like, wow, the kids really love me. Everybody knows me. I grew up a PK. Like, you know, this was, I, I had a lot of my identity in that, and I didn't know that until I moved and I took that step into the call and I had to get over myself and get to this humbled place of I moved to Sweden was actually the next step after that and I went to a whole new country ministry nobody knew me and I wanted to almost shout from the mountain hello I, I sing I love kids you know <laughs> but then the Lord says get down Lauren get low and then we'll take you and see what's next and it was painful it was painful, but worth it. <laughs> I love your transparency. So he's bringing you to a place of honest and brokenness, right? Honesty and humility and brokenness. It's beautiful. All right, so uh, let me ask you this. What do you as a missionary sharing the gospel around the world? You guys heard like some of those festivals, 40,000 kids and sometimes demons being cast out, people being set free. Uh, we just talked about uh, the reality of good and evil and demonic realm and principalities. And we're reading Ephesians 6 just two weeks ago. What do you want as a missionary? What do you wish every American Christian realized? So if you, were, if you went out to eat today with all of these beautiful people that are they're Christians in America, how many of you guys are a Christian in America? Just curious. All right. So you go out to eat with them, right? And you're like, if I could challenge you with this one thought about Christianity or life or pursuing God, what, what would you tell an American Christian? We are so blessed. We have so much. And I think we take it for, for advantage. And I think it's so, you don't realize till you go to a lot of these places I've been going and poverty and so forth. You don't realize that, yeah, just if they would see the way we live. If they would literally see it and how just a little bit of money would just help them to even have enough clothes for their kids to go to school. I mean, we are just so blessed. And I love what you said about if one family would support one missionary who's going to maybe touch others because it's just a, a connection of the way we can show the world that we are so blessed. We have so much. How can we, how can we be a people that say we love <laughs> like Jesus if we're not really loving the poor and, and going after, after that in all our hearts? So, but you don't always know it and believe it till you really get to see it with your own eyes, and you, then you experience it. But we are so blessed. That's so powerful. So we're blessed. And I don't know if you caught that. Sound like the book of James, right? Well, I don't know if we can really say we love Jesus unless we care about the poor. If you forget the rest of my message, that's enough to challenge your heart, right? All right, give Lauren a hand. Thank you for sharing with us today. That was beautiful. I'm actually just going to sit down while I talk today. Is that okay? All right, somebody found that funny back there. <laughs> I'll always love that laugh. I call it the old man laugh. <laughs> okay. Don't know who that was. I just made fun of you. I'm sorry. I just want to share a little bit of my story, and then we're going to talk about um, Peter and Jacob. And I think I'm going to actually skip the part about Peter and talk to just talk about Jacob because it was such a beautiful time in God's presence, and I didn't want to rush that. That was amazing. Um, Say, so real quick, I felt like I wanted to share some of my story with you guys. And some of this is going to be funny. And real quick, I want to prophesy to this 
guy that's like, you're like bald. I'm sorry I'm calling out your baldness. But I, I did. <laughs> While she was talking, I just was getting this word over you, and I'm not sure who you are, but can you guys just stretch your hands towards this guy right here? I think you're a guest with us. Are you Ed's son? Oh, man, you got something coming for you now. I didn't realize that till. well, I'm going to ignore the fact that I know that now, but I'm still going to tell you what I saw in my spirit. I just feel like you are really sharp. You're really uh, smart. And the Lord, I see a robe of uh, purple on you. And the Lord's going to put you in many favorable places. You have a coat of favor on you. And it's beautiful. It's like Joseph. And uh, you, can't, you can't even get rid of that favor. And the, I think the Lord wants to just encourage you that that favor is so beautiful on you. Um, he's going to put you in places where big decisions are made. And I, I, just see, I just see an oil coming over your head. And I was saying, Lord, why is his head looks, why, why are you pointing, why you keep pointing out his baldness to me? Seriously, I'm trying to have this conversation with the Lord while I'm listening to the Lord. So it was very, sometimes the Holy Spirit is very distracting. But anyway, I saw the Lord pouring oil. He said, it's shiny. He, said, he says, I'm pouring oil over his head. And there's a favor coming on your life that is really beautiful. And it, you're going to be in some, some very important, sitting, at, seated at very important tables and the Lord wants to encourage you to use your mouth. You are a mouthpiece. Everybody look at, what's your name? Josh. Can everybody just look to Josh and prophesy with me? Say, Josh, you're highly favored and you are a mouthpiece. One more time. Look right at him. Look at that bald head. Say, Josh, you are highly favored and you are a mouthpiece. And I can see a sensitivity in your wife, too. The Lord's doing something with missions. And I don't know if he's going to use the, the finances that are going to come your way with missions. But I think you need to maybe partner with our missionary out there. I'm not, like, telling you to give. That's really weird. I would never do that. I'm just telling you there's something in your heart with missions, right? And he's stirring up, like, I want my life to count and be meaningful. And it's connected to your employment. It's connected to your role. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Oh, that was cool. Okay. I grew up as a pastor's kid. Now I really got to tell this fast. But anyway, I grew up um, as a pastor's kid, and I just want to say I was left at church and the airport, and I just wanted to say that. Just wanted my parents to feel guilt and shame because that's what we're all about, a rock of grace, rock of wrath. No, just kidding. Um, I mean, I'm not kidding. I was left at church twice, actually. I was banging on the window, little nails. It was terrible. But I had a great upbringing. As you know, my parents are just incredible uh, spiritual heroes of my life and enjoyed, enjoyed Royal Rangers. Uh, had a lot of good memories with my dad there. Uh, I loved youth group. When I was 12, uh, I was like, man, I want to play guitar in the youth group. And, and I, was, I was writing this out and I was thinking back through these memories. And I, I got so grateful all of a sudden for a man named Nate. And I just still don't know his last name. But there was a young man named Nate that was maybe 17 or 18 years old, and he mentored me he, on guitar for a good couple months. He was, like, showing me chords, and we were learning newsboy songs and all those cheesy, you know, pretty much Christian boy band songs at the time. Um, and meant a lot to me, though. So, Nate, if you're listening, God used you. Gave my heart to Christ right around that age at 13, and I felt called to ministry at the age of 14. I was a big prairie camp. How many of you guys have ever been to youth camp? Just raise your hand. It's about 20%. Wait, wait, raise it one more time. I'm just curious. Oh, wow, maybe about 30%. That's a lot of campers. How many of you went to like a really ghetto fabulous camp like I did? Big prairie, like held together by duct tape. Okay, how many of you have been to the new place, Heartland? It's like nice, air conditioning. Yeah, it's spoiled, spoiled. Um, but I got my life totally changed by God at camp. And I want to say something real quick. You, um, I, I encountered a lot of, I had a lot of these beautiful encounters with the Lord. And it's all his grace. But I was just thinking as I'm saying this, I went to camp. And I, in fact, I remember my first year I went with Victory Christian Center. We weren't going, our, our church wasn't going. And I was the only kid. And they took me in uh, and, and just pretended I was in their youth group. But I want to tell you, you, you can experience God when you put your place in a place to experience God. So I don't know who that's for, but position yourself for times with the Lord, and he will meet you there. Amen? So I experienced God in a powerful way. I was on the floor for a couple hours, honestly, just overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. 
felt called to ministry. Some of you know this story. I came home and told my dad, you guys are going to love this. If you know Mark Beale, this is classic Mark Beale. So I knock on his door about one in the morning and I said, Dad, I'm 14. Okay, I'm just a little guy. Well, I'm still a little guy, but I'm 14. I said, hey, I'm called to ministry. He opens the door. He goes, no, you're not, and shuts the door. I'm like, what a jerk. So I knock. He opens the door. And I was like, Dad, I was at camp and I was called to ministry. He goes, no, you weren't. And shut the door. I was like, I was so mad. I was so mad. I pounded this time. I'm not knocking. I remember I was like, poof, poof, poof. open the door. And I said, Dad, I'm called to ministry. And I'm going whether you want. I'm going to ministry whether you want me to or not. He goes, good. I was just checking if it was real. <laughs> shut the door. <laughs> Can you believe that? This is classic Mark Beale, right? I know. He used to do drug addiction recovery by putting drug addicts' hands on a stove. <laughs> now do you want to be an addict? But it worked. Anyway, that was my story growing up. As I was called to ministry, very intense. And, uh, but it became really real for me. The idea of ministry became very real for me. I started a Bible study at my church or at my, uh, at my school. And I will never forget, there was only five or six kids coming. And I was starting to feel discouraged. And then it got down to two kids. And one day when there was two kids there, uh, one of the two, her name was Ashley. And I will never forget this because this was, this was a, a trajectory. You guys, have, you guys know what I'm talking about, like milestones in your life when God changed you? This was a milestone, life, a milestone in my life because a, a young girl named Ashley received Christ. And it was incredibly real. It wasn't even the devotion that day. Uh, but it, the Holy Spirit like entered the room and she's like, I want to be a Christian. And I'm like, whoa. And I just led her, led her to Christ. And she got, tragically, she was killed in a car accident that next month. And, and that next month. And the Holy Spirit, I'll never forget, was like, your, your Bible study matters. Your Bible study matters. And that's when God became very real to me. Like, this matters. This isn't just a church thing that my dad does and that now I want to do. No, it was, it was very real. And so I just want to share some of these things with you that were so real to me. Right around that same time, I fell in love with Danielle. I was, becoming 15, I was 15. And the reason I know I was thinking back is because I couldn't wait till I got my license because the minute I get my license, I can drive to her house. You know, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, just real quick, is Bob here? Is Bob? Oh, man. I'm, okay. So I'm just going to tell you guys what happened when I asked Danielle if I could date her. Is that okay? Not okay. Is that okay? I'm not going to look at Bob. Is that okay over here? He still scares me. I walk downstairs, and he's working on the AC unit, which is a terrible timing for me. But anyway, I come up to him, and I was nervous, more nervous than I've ever been in my life. And I'm, like, shaking. I'm, like, hey, hey, Bob, Mr. Bobby. Um, um. Uh, I like your daughter, and I want to, like, you know, be, like, date her. Okay, he turns around with a 15-inch wrench, and he goes, what are your intentions with my daughter? And he's holding a wrench. And I was like, please don't beat me to death. Like, I was thinking he was going to beat me to death right there. And I'm like, I don't know. I just want to be her friend, and I think she's cute. That's all I know. So he said yes, but he scared the crap out of me at first. So thank you for that. Scared the fear of God into me. And, uh, yeah, so after that, we dated, and I went to, I was going to go to Bible college, uh, but I didn't have enough money saved up, and the school I want to go to had this unique policy where you had to pay for half of the school year up front. So I went to uh, work uh, with my brother-in-law's company, Jimmy, you guys know Jimmy, the guy that plays guitar over here to the right, and I worked in a flooring warehouse for like 10 to 12 hours a day. And I would, I was just over, I worked too much. So I would come home and sometimes fall asleep literally at the dining, is that true or not? I'd fall asleep at the dining room table. And, uh, but it was really good for me because I saw like just real hard work and, uh, and just kind of real American life for so many people. And, and uh, at the, when I got there, a guy named Jerry was starting a, a church. And isn't it interesting how God knew, uh, you guys know God's like really smart, right? Okay, so he knew that it would put it in my heart to plant churches, so I got to be a part of a church plant from the scratch, and I was only 17 years old, and I was just turning 18 that August, and uh, became the worship leader for a church called The Well, uh, reaches about 600 people uh, today, and Pastor Jerry is an amazing guy, but I learned a lot from Pastor Jerry, his gift to communicate, his, his work ethic, he actually waited tables for 40 hours a week and then would prepare to be a pastor. 
and then we would meet with people, prepare a sermon, and I watched this unfold, and it was, it was amazing to me. Um, a, lot of good, a lot of amazing stories there. And then I went to Brownsville, and uh, I started growing out my hair in Chicago, so I looked like an anorexic Fabio, um, and that was great. I thought it was awesome, but Danielle did not. She's like, that looks really stupid. But when I played my guitar, it was cool, you know, because I could swing my hair back. But you grow and you mature. Um, after that, uh, in Brownsville, I want to tell you, I had some incredible encounters in Brownsville. I've told you about many of them. I want to tell you again, because I think it's really important, and I think it's going to happen here, that I had many times when the presence of God would fill the room so strongly that the teacher couldn't teach and the students couldn't learn. We would just would all at once bow down and worship Jesus. Who thinks that's pretty cool? I thought it was pretty cool. I did not know what I was in for. I, didn't, I wasn't expecting all that. I knew God was doing something there. I had visited there and... God had touched my life there when I was about 16, and that was one of the reasons I'd, I'd gone back there. My sister Nancy had gone. And, but going there, I wasn't expecting times when I was playing guitar uh, for, for worship, and I wasn't expecting multiple services where drug addicts would run to the altar and throw their drug stuff on my pedal board. I'm like, what? What is happening? Like, they were so convicted by the Spirit. They just had to get rid of their drug stuff. You guys realize pastors don't, like, plan that, right? When we're preaching, we're not expecting someone to run up and throw drug paraphernalia on the stage. But that's how real the presence of God was at Brownsville. How many of us would say, like, you want to see that happen right here in Trumbull County? I know I do. And we already see God do doing a work and convicting hearts, but I'm just telling you, I experienced something there that changed my life forever. I experienced times of worship with Lyndall leading worship. This is what I love about Will is he's so sensitive to the spirit. Can you put your hands together for Will real quick and just thank him? Because I want you to know we have something very special here. There are thousands, amen? There are thousands of song leaders. Thousands of song leaders, but there are a few worship leaders. Right? And so there's a calling and that anointing on Will's life that was on Lyndall's life where we could worship sometimes for an hour, hour and a half, and nobody was in a rush to get to the sermon or to get home to, or go out to Denny's or whatever it was. Um, it was Denny's there, as you could tell, but you get the idea. Like it was powerful to sit in that atmosphere, to sit in that. I want to tell you a couple things before I read about Jacob. I'm going to skip the part about Peter, but I'm going to talk about Jacob. But before I do, I want to tell you a couple things. If you're taking notes, I'm not, I don't have these on the screen today. If you have your iPad or iPhone or a pen, I want you to just write a couple things. Number one, your story matters. And your story should be told because it is the, it is the testimony of God's goodness. It is the testimony of God's goodness. Your story. Everybody put your hand on your heart and say, my story. Because see, I... It's not my story. Trevor's story isn't my story. Elijah's story isn't my story. The things that God has taught and is teaching Elijah about himself is different than me. And it's beautiful and powerful and needs told. Amen? Your story can inspire someone else to have faith in God. This, this is one of my favorite things about pastoring is to just have someone over for a meal and hear their story. And so many of you have heard your stories, and it's a beautiful, it's amazing, and sometimes the heartache, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, the heartache, the hard things in life that we experienced, we look back and we say, that's when God ministered to us the most, isn't it? Think about the way Paul inspired Timothy, all right? Think about the way that he inspired Timothy and told his story to young Timothy, 
and didn't just do his thing, but inspired someone else's story. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and self-control. And I read that verse three weeks ago when we talked about the demonic realm, but I want to say it again, because when you open your mouth, and you speak boldly the goodness of God, that's because he has filled you with his love. Let me say it again. It's because he's filled you. So love compels you to speak the truth. Love compels you to invite people into the goodness of God. But fear of man will tell you, zip it. Don't say a word. What if you break a friendship? What if you lose your job for this? And the enemy will get in your head and tell you, don't tell your story. Or he'll tell you this lie. Have you ever heard this lie? Your story isn't as good as their story. Do you know one of the best testimonies you can have is that God spared you from different addictions and pitfalls. Amen? Come on, somebody, somebody said, I needed that, right? Listen, your story matters. And don't let the enemy get in your head and say, well, let somebody else tell. No, you tell your story. The book of Revelation says, right, that in the end times, they overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And God is raising up a people in these end times who will speak out, who will speak up, who will talk to teachers, who will talk to board members, who will talk to principals, who will talk to neighbors about what the Bible says, about truth, about reality, about gender, about love, about the Bible, Amen? So we have to be willing to let the spirit of wisdom come into our life and give us the fear of the Lord. The spirit of wisdom is the spirit of God. What is that wisdom? It's the fear of the Lord, right? And will cause you to run from sin and to cause you to resist the devil and to chase after the things of God. To let your story be marked by encounters with God. And here's the thing. I want to tell you, when you tell your testimony and you get brutally honest, right? So God had me do this three years ago. Uh, you can look up that video if you want. But God had me get brutally honest about the darkest time in my life. And he asked me to do it on a Sunday morning. I was like, no thanks, God. No thanks. Right? And God has a way. Don't you think God has a way of getting your attention? Right? So I had typed it into my sermon and then deleted it and then typed it and then deleted it three times. And you know how God got my attention? An artist came over the Friday before and he starts rapping. It was a rap artist. And he starts rapping the very things that God was dealing with me about. And I was like, oh, I was feeling the conviction, like major. So God used that, though, because multiple people came up to me after that sermon and said, Jordan, thank you for being so real. I thought I was the only one. Hear me. This is what a testimony does. It breaks the lie that says, what's wrong with you? You're the only one. Let me say that again. The enemy is the accuser of the brethren. He's the intruder. How many were here the last three weeks? We talked about who is the enemy, right? Who is God, who is man, and who is Satan? The enemy not only tempts you to sin, but then once you do sin, he tries to get you in a place of shame where you hide from everyone and you hide from God. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? The only way, though, hear me, that grace can do its work is when you let, let the door open and you say, God, this is what I need forgiven of. And I'll tell you, when you really get free is when you're willing to tell others, this is what God forgave me of. You say, Jordan, I could never do that. See, here's what the Satan tells you. What if they find out? If you already tells them, if tells them, if you already tell people what God saved you up, who cares if they find out? They already know. See how it gets you free? It gets you free. Turn to your neighbor and say, Do you want to get free? Because see, James 5:16 says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. See, we confess our sins to God for forgiveness. We confess our sins to one another for healing. 
And a lot of Christians miss out on the healing and the freedom that God wants to give them in life because they're, 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 too, they're too, I'm not going to say anything that God forgave me of. But I want to tell you that right there in a life group, a life group is a great way to say, look, this is what God taught me five years ago or five days ago, and this is what I'm learning. Amen? I want to tell you there is a supernatural power in the telling of your story. Jesse and I were talking about this over dinner a couple nights ago. Think about this. Jesus spoke the world into existence. Come on. There's sound waves are vibrations that have power. I want to say it again. Sound waves, they're vibrations that have power. Do you guys know that? It's real. This is why I think music is so fascinating, such a mystery to me. Sound waves, sound was created by God. Put your hand up if you know what I'm talking about. Sound was created by God. The enemy tries to manipulate. The enemy always manipulates because he can't create, so he manipulates. So sound is created by God, and God with a spoken word said, earth. I don't know if he said it like that. Earth, come into existence. Oceans, waves. I think I want some trees. I think I want a Nolan over here. I think I want a Carol over here. Now, Carol, you have to be as loud as Nolan. No, I'm just kidding. Carol. Carol. Yeah. He creatively speaks, and Carol comes to life, and Nolan comes to life, and the trees. He, at the sound of his mouth, isn't that powerful? By the way, this is why I think prophecy is so powerful. This is why Paul says, above all else, I wish that all would prophesy. Why? Because there's power when you release the truth. It's one thing to have the truth. It's another to release the truth because it changes the atmosphere. Come on, the vibration. Is anybody getting this? Is it hitting your spirit? All right. So the power of your story. In fact, I want to back up and tell you something I skipped over real quick. Part of my story was being at Brownsville. And Jody, who was one of the staff, is the, pre the president's uh, assistant, she kept coming up to me and saying, you have a gift of prophecy. I know you do. And I didn't, I didn't really understand what that meant. And then she started knowing every time she would come up to me and say, you want to prophesy to that guy in the red shirt, don't you? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, how does she know this? This is weird. This is like Twilight Zone. Like I would have a thought about someone. And then she would have a word of knowledge about my word of knowledge. <laughs> Let that mess with your theology. So she would come up and say, Jordan, are you going to be faithful or not? And it would convict me. And this was semester after semester, year after year. She'd say, Jordan, you have a gift of prophecy. Use it. And I'm telling you, I would not be prophesying if it wasn't for Jody opening her mouth and challenging me. You guys receiving this today? So I want you to be thinking, who is around you that you can be sharing your story with and encouraging, using your mouth and testifying? I want you to think for a moment. I'm going to skip the part about Peter, and I'm just going to share. Oh, that was a good part. We're going to save that for another sermon. I was really excited about that, but that's okay. Turn in your Bibles, and just, I'll just give you just another five minutes if you're okay. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 32. I want to tell you about a time when Jacob wrestled with God. And I had this whole thing prepared about with, with Peter and then my story. And then I actually, early this morning, I always ask God on Sunday mornings, is there one more thing you want to say? And he led me to Genesis for some reason. He led me to this. And I found out why. And you'll find out in just a minute. Jacob is trying to make amends with his brother Esau. If you don't know, Jacob and Esau were Abraham's sons. It's about four weeks ago we talked about Abraham receiving the promise. He's the father of faith. He's the patriarch of Israel. All of God's people would be blessed through this family. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Say through this family. All right, so Jacob, though, he's born and he's, de he's deceptive. He's always trying to wiggle his way out of something and manipulate the data, manipulate the facts, and he's deceptive. And he has this problem, right? So Isaac has these two sons, Jacob and Esau, and Esau's just along for the ride, you know? So he decided his brother Esau, he had deceived him many times later, and now in their adult lives, Jacob wants to make amends, and he hears Esau is coming to him. Now, he's afraid for his life because he thinks his older brother, which, by the way, was a hunter, 
okay? So probably much stronger than him, much more athletic, if you will. Like, he's like, he's going to kill me. Now, Jacob had acquired a lot of wealth. The blessing of God certainly was upon his life, just like God had said. And so he tries to give him half of all of his livestock. So I want you to picture this. Jacob is a shepherd. He has all this livestock. He has these sheep, these cattle, and these goats. And he, he sends his servants ahead and says, tell Esau, hey, bro, it's all good. I don't know if he did that gang sign, whatever that was. But he said, it's all good between you, me and you. You just take half of this and please don't kill me. You guys tracking with me? Okay. But Esau walks past them and Jacob's like, oh, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. And embraces him. Wow. So let's read it. Let's pick it up. Genesis 32, verse 6. O God of my father Abraham, God of Isaac, who said to me, return to your country and your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of these deeds and your steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For only with my staff I crossed over Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Deliver me from the hand of my brother, the hand of Esau. I fear him that he may come and attack me, my mothers and their children. But you said, you said, God, I surely will do you good and make your offspring as numerous as the sea. This is funny to me because he's telling God, you realize, God, if Esau kills me, you can't make good on your promise to make me a father of many nations. Isn't that hilarious? He's like, so you pretty much have to let me live. And so he creates this huge peace offering. Verse 22, we pick it up, verse 22. The same night he rose and he took his two wives. By the way, I don't recommend that. One wife was, is good. Just one. Everybody say, just one? <laughs> Side note. Okay. He took all his female servants, 11 children, crossed over the fort. He took them and he sent them across and everything he said. And, he, and Jacob left alone. Everybody say alone. You see, that jumped off the page to me. Jacob, his whole life, is trying to hide behind others, hide behind his wealth, his possession, his intellect, his ability to change the facts, but no, Jacob is now alone. One more time, everybody say alone. You see, God will wait till you're alone. You guys know God, God will sometimes let all of your friends desert you so he can finally get your attention. God will sometimes let the job not work out so he can get your attention. When Jacob was all alone, a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled him. He said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have wrestled with God and with man and have prevailed. So now he's realizing this is an angel or this is God himself. Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. He said, why is it that you ask my name? But there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel for saying, I have seen God face to face, but he has let me live. The sun rose upon him as he passed, limping because of his hip. Now look at, now look at verse chapter 33. So he wrestled with God. Everybody got that? Wrestles with God. He's got a limp. I think it would be good for a lot of American Christians to walk with a limp. Pastor Ed one time told me over breakfast, he said, I don't trust anybody without a limp. And that stuck with me because I knew what he was referencing this chapter right here. Esau ran to him and embraced him. So he encounters God alone with God thinking Esau's on his way over the hill country. He's going to kill me. But Esau walks past Leah, walks past Rachel, all the kids, all the livestock, and walks right up and embraces him. When Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the children, he said, who are all these? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given. The servants drew near and all their children, and Leah likewise and her children, they all bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they too bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company? And Jacob said, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Esau said, I already have enough, brother. Keep what you have. Jacob said, no, please, I have found favor in God's sight. Let me have find favor in your sight. Accept this gift. Listen to what he says. For I have seen your face, 
which is like seeing the face of God and you have accepted me. I've read the Bible through many times. I've never seen that. Esau was deceived by Jacob, stole his birthright. How many of you are Esau and your younger brother Twerp steals inheritance? You'd be pretty ticked. But for some reason, God softens Esau's heart. And here's what I want to say. If you are willing to forgive people, come on, that's what we talked about last week, and just let your story be what it is, signs of God's grace. Look how Joseph said, in your face I saw God. Wow. The grace of God right there seen in Esau's face. Now check out what happened next. Genesis 35, look at verse 3. Let us arise and go up to Bethel. There I will make an altar to God who answers me in my distress and has been with me everywhere I have gone. Do you know God's been with you throughout your entire journey? How many can look back on life and say, my story, even with its detours, God was with me? Isn't that beautiful? Fast forward to verse 14, look at this. He built a pillar of stone. He poured a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. Every time future generations would walk past this pillar of stone, at least the next few months anyway, they would smell the oil that Jacob poured. He said, there in my distress, do you know in your hardest times of life, the hardest parts of your story. How many have some hard parts of your story? In the hardest parts of your story, there's some anointing there. He poured oil on that rock. Oil is a symbol of anointing. I'm going to have Will come up and we're going to lead this song again as we close. I want you to think about this. There is oil in your story. Do you hear that this morning? Think back to some of the hardest thing you went through. If you have a time that you can think of that was very hard financially, raise your hand. There's oil in that story. You catch what I'm saying? Think about a time when your marriage was on the brink. There's oil in that story. There's anointing that you can draw from. You see, when... When Samson, remember, remember when Samson killed the lion? It's his greatest battle, but what happens later? There's honey in the carcass. There's oil on that rock, that place where you were in your lowest moment, when you were in your distress and you thought, everybody has rejected me, everything's going wrong in my life. Guys, part of my story I left out today, I would tell you right now, stand up to your feet. I won't go into the specifics of it because it'd be very awkward. But I will tell you, I went through something very difficult in Bible college. And I went to three doctors. And do you know what they told me? That I wouldn't have kids. Isn't Satan's life funny? Now I have so many kids, I can't keep track of them. I have to number them because there's so many. I don't even call them by their name. I'm like, is there five? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we're good. But I really wanted kids. And so I, I knew, I was already in love with Danielle. And I knew coming out of Bible college, like we're going to have kids. And so for, for me to go to a doctor and him to say, you're not going to have kids. I was mad at God. I was really mad at God. You ever been mad at God? It's the only couple of you nodded there, which tells me you, we need to get to a new place of brokenness. So I'm going to ask again. Have you ever been mad at God? Yeah. Do you know it's okay to say that? Do you know that's half the book of Psalms? God, where are you in my distress? Do you know what God wants from you more than anything else? Honesty. Can I say it again? God wants more than anything else from you, just honesty. Honesty. He wants brokenness. And when you go through something, and some of you might be in the room today, and you're thinking, I'm going through something right now. And you say, you know, I'm mad at God because he hasn't answered me. 
And here's the thing, I thought for sure this doctor was wrong, so I went to the next doctor. Same thing. You're not going to be able to have kids. And I looked right at him with tears in my eyes and said, I'm going to have kids. I promise, I remember it. I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, I'm going to have kids. I said, God will heal this, I promise you. And God did, and it was fine. But that moment was a dark moment in my life that now I can look at, I can have a moment with you. If Dennis were to come to me and say, Jordan, I don't even know if God can handle this. I'd be like, oh, God can handle it. Let me tell you my story. You see what I'm saying? It was a, by the way, it was two months after that that I prophesied to a woman about God opening up her barren womb and God did it. And she, and she got pregnant. And she had a cyst and the doctor told her she would never have kids. See, my story builds faith in you for your story. And your story builds faith in whoever you are telling it to. And I promise you, your story matters. Amen? Your story matters. Jacob's story is like Peter's story. He messed up, right? But God met him alone. Peter's not with all the other disciples. Jesus finds Peter on the shore alone and he's making breakfast for him. And he says, do you still love me? Because I still love you. Wow. Jesus always will come to you when you're all alone. Before we sing this song, I want to give an opportunity. Just bow your heads. If you say right now, I got to tell you, Pastor Jordan, I have felt alone. I'm going through something nobody knows about. And it's a lot to bear. I want to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to have you come forward. Just raise your hand. Yeah. Come on, just be honest. Just raise it up. About 20 of you. Here's what's amazing. God knows exactly what you're going through. And for those of you that raised your hand, I want to invite you to make sure that at some point you go to a life group and you say, here's what it is. I got to lay it all out there. Sometimes it's something out of your control, but sometimes it's, it's, it's a sin of your own doing, right? So you got to be honest with that. Find a friend and say, hey, can you keep this between me and you? But this is what I'm struggling with. And I promise you there is a freedom that's going to come into your life if you will open the door of honesty. So let's just all, if we could, just open our hands. Let's pray something together, and then Will's going to lead us in this song that he taught us. Heavenly Father, let's all say this. Heavenly Father, teach me to be honest. Teach me to be broken, humble. Teach him to be real. And bring healing to the areas of my life that I previously left off limits. Let's say that again. Bring healing to the areas of my life that I previously left off limits. Say this to him. Say, Jesus, you have access to every part of me. Nothing hidden. Nothing hidden. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this together.
sings my soul. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Lightning crashes and thunder. has trembled the curtain torn hallelujah and grace was given and sins atoned hallelujah oh I'm forgiven no more you are good in every part of our story. Like Jacob, when we were in our distress, when we were afraid that all of our bad decisions were mounting up and that we were finally going to face the consequences like Jacob felt that day, you met us with grace. You sent somebody just in the nick of time to tell us about your grace, to tell us that you would forgive us. Father, maybe in, just like in Jacob's case, the person that we thought would never forgive us forgave us, whether that was our spouse or our boss or whoever it was. So, Father, we just collectively, we, we want to say to you, thank you for grace. Can you just say that out loud with me? Thank you for grace, God. Thank you for grace. God, give us the courage to tell our story, no matter what it is, no matter where we go. And God, help us to avoid that pit of shame and just be real with what you forgave us of. Because, God, when we do that, we put you on the throne. You are the hero, not us. You are the hero of the story. We love you. In Jesus